chilling tales for dark nights. A Truck Stop Horror by Joshua L. Hood. Narrated by Peter Bishop. Featuring Jesse Cornett, Brendan Hulbert, Rebecca Peason, Sariana Gregg, Otis Jiry, Jonathan Jones, Steve Taylor, Andrea Rose, and Joseph Gable. Original score, production and sound design by Jesse Cornett. An island of light floated in the distance, straight ahead and just off to the right. It flickered behind the trees, then sank below an invisible ridge as the LeBaron rattled down the hill in the dark. A single headlight stabbed into the night through ancient pines ahead of it. Paul eased off the gas a touch and let gravity do its part. On the last hill, he felt the splutter and lurch of a thirsty gas tank. He didn't know how many hills the car had left in it. The light island was glowing closer. Paul might make it yet. With a triumphant splutter and pop, the LeBaron rolled past the fuel pumps and into a parking spot at the edge of the lot. Paul had eight dollars in his pocket and didn't want to spend it all refueling the clunker before he got some coffee to refuel himself. Since the next town was over 80 miles away, he was aware that he might have to skip paying for gas altogether, which would be easier if he waited to fuel up until after he ate. It all depended on the price of coffee and some pecan pie. Gas was 92 cents a gallon here. It was always more expensive at these backwards truck stops, and so was the coffee. Eight bucks doesn't go as far as it used to, he lamented. Stepping out of the car, he felt like he was indeed on a floating island in the center of a black sea. The world beyond the orange floodlights had blinked into darkness when he pulled into the parking lot. Paul liked that. It made him feel safer when the unknown possibilities of the world were at bay. A smaller world was easier to handle, and from the island of light, the only sign of the feral wilderness surrounding him was the smell of trees and the creak of wood swaying in the breeze. Inside the cafe, everyone had been staring out the windows. They all jumped when the bell door cheerily announced Paul's entrance. Then they were all staring at him. Paul had been too self-absorbed to even notice the other cars in the parking lot. But there were half a dozen people inhabiting the single strip of vinyl booths. He stopped short, noting the quizzically horrified looks on their faces. He wondered briefly if he'd remembered to zip his fly. But... Did, didn't you see? Stuttered one man, a baseball cap trucker who looked like he should have had better command of his senses than he did. Didn't you see? He pointed out the window, and Paul realized that there was more confusion in his voice than fear, but only barely. Paul didn't look out into the parking lot where the man pointed. Most of the others had gone back to staring, but Paul was always a little paranoid of turning his back to a crowd even a small one. I should call the police, said the waitress behind the counter. Yeah, I'm calling the police. Yeah, replied a large greasy apron man, the only one who still hadn't looked away from Paul. Paul turned his back to the door to make as smooth an exit as possible. He didn't know if he had any warrants, but he never liked the sound of police. Don't, the greasy apron said. Paul stopped. Look, he pointed out the window. Paul finally looked, cautiously, one hand still on the door. At first there was nothing. Dark night, glowing lights, dull grey concrete. Between the pumps, Greasy Apron said, and then Paul saw it. At first it was too obvious to be what it was. Then it became too obvious to be anything else. Like the human brain just has a way of knowing some things. 
It was all black except for a white hand sticking out at an odd angle. The crumpled heap of a human corpse lay smack in the center of the parking lot. Well, shit, Paul muttered, then asked in a shaky voice, What's that about? A pink sweated woman in a booth with a dopey looking boyfriend answered, I don't know, I, I swear we were out there just five minutes ago and there was nothing, no one out there. Yeah, said dopey boyfriend. We filled up at pump three, uh, there was nothing. Paul looked at their table. No food, but opened menus. They clearly hadn't been there much longer than he had. Sh should we go help? Asked the pink sweated woman. Probably, said Greasy Apron, but he didn't move to volunteer. A scraggly man shifted uncomfortably. Don't bother with it. The guy's dead, trust me. I know dead, and that's dead. He was wearing old army greens and had hair almost as greasy as the other guy's apron. Paul was too young for the draft, but he knew a Nam vet when he saw one. He didn't doubt the guy for a moment. The waitress's voice broke through the brief silence. They're on their way. A phone clicked as she hung it back on the wall. The police said to stay inside. That could be a while, said Greasy Apron. We're a long ways out. Well, Paul said, not to sound crass, but I'd wait a lot better with coffee and a slice of pecan- The tapes! Shouted the waitress, a trace of hope in her voice. Oh yeah, said Greasy Apron. What tapes? Asked Pink Sweater. The waitress went bustling toward the kitchen. We just installed cameras, the security kind. We got one for each pump. So if someone tries to pump and dash, we get their license plate and the cops can catch them. Greasy Apron finished for her. Paul was suddenly very aware that he might have to skip the pie. All right, let's get a look at him then, said Dopey Boyfriend, still staring at the corpse in the lot. The trucker broke in. Well... I don't feel like I'm really a part of this. He stood up and walked toward the door. Paul took his hand off the push bar and stepped slightly aside. Now hold on there, said Greasy Apron. You just wait a minute. I ain't got to wait for nothing. I got my gas, money for the burger on the table. You can't stop me. Fear rose in his voice. I ain't gonna stop you, said Greasy Apron. But I'd like to point out that ten minutes ago there wasn't a dead guy lying thirty feet away from that front door. And now there is. And it's sure as shit that guy didn't walk here on his own. Now what are you saying? You saying I had something to do with this? The trucker raised his voice. Now how would I be saying that? Calm down, fella. Don't think about it. You didn't do it. None of us did it. But someone did it. And they're no further than ten minutes away in any direction. You really want to be going out there now? The trucker slowed his pace and stopped right in front of the door. He peered out into the darkness beyond the shores of the island and said nothing. Paul took a couple of steps back from the door. The corpse loomed. Besides, yelled waitress from the kitchen. Ain't you got no sense of mystery? Don't you want to see who done it? She sounded almost excited. Got it rewound. Come back here and look. Whether she was just talking to her co-worker in the greasy apron, or if she meant everybody, they all shuffled back into the kitchen and huddled around a back desk, propped up on one side by a safe and piled with old receipts. Above it hung a black and white TV mounted to the wall. Each corner of the TV showed a different gas pump in grainy shades of gray. Where the four points met in the middle was a slightly misaligned black lump. The pictures disappeared with a click and were replaced with a single, blown-up version of pump number three. There was no body. The time code read 20 minutes earlier. Ghosts of screen burn still crisscrossed the image, adding to the poor resolution. Paul doubted that anyone was in danger of getting their plate number read by this cheap system, at least after dark. The waitress clicked a button on the VCR and the image warbled forward until the shape of an Oldsmobile pulled up to the pump. It was 12 minutes earlier. That's our car, said Pink Sweater. There I am, heading inside to get a table, she narrated. And there's Ducky getting gas. The waitress clicked fast forward again. The dopey boyfriend, Ducky, tapped his toe rapidly, then jumped back into his car in a big old hurry. 
Stop there, Pink Sweater said. The image clicked back to normal speed. Just as the back corner of Dougie's old winked out of view, a shadowed shape could be seen at the corner of the screen. It was at the very top of the display, blurry, indistinct, but as the tape rolled forward, it was clear that the shape was loping, like a foot rising and falling out of view. Everyone was holding their breaths. The foot moved across the top of the screen, stopped at the opposite corner, shuffled around a little, flopped a silent but heavy object down onto the pavement, then walked slowly back the way it had come. The image went still, empty except for that one dark shape at the corner. No one spoke for a moment. Another angle, Jesus. Greasy Apron said suddenly. Everybody jumped. <laughs> Sorry. But let's try another angle. Try, try camera four. It shows some of the entrance and more of the parking lot. The waitress hesitated, then pushed eject. The tape from camera four was pushed heavily into the slot and it whirred backwards. She stopped it and the screen popped into view. From the new angle, the body would be at the bottom right corner of the screen. In the top left was the entrance into the parking lot, the shore of the island. Suddenly, Paul felt less secure in this isolated little world. This time, she fast-forwarded the image to just where Dougie started driving away from pump three. Then, instead of hitting play, the waitress hit stop. Everyone looked at her. She took a big breath and, almost enthusiastically, hit the play button. All eyes snapped to the screen. A dark shape emerged. It was much bigger from this angle. Everything visible but its feet. The shape was that of a man, but not quite. It had the body hefted over the shoulder closest to the camera, so that only the limp corpse could be seen above its waist. It walked heavily. The color of its clothes couldn't be made out, and though no one said it, it was because they all knew that its clothes were actually some sort of matted and tangled fur. And it was tall. Impossible to tell exactly how tall, but tall. Behind the lump of a corpse, a long arm swung down in a far more exaggerated way than necessary for its pace. Distended fingers, maybe sharp at the ends, clenched and unclenched into a fist as though it was working out its tensions on an invisible stress ball. It stopped. The body swung left, then right, rocking almost rhythmically. Was it looking for someone? Making sure it was unseen? Impossible to tell. With an ungraceful and soundless thud, it dropped the body onto the ground and turned back the way it had come. That's when everyone saw its face. Resolution was poor, but it looked black-eyed and thick-jawed. Its sneer flickered on the little screen. Its neck was thick and its jaw stretched to an underbite. It scowled, or at least looked like it scowled under its heavy brow. The people in the diner watched until it left the screen. But this time, they didn't start breathing again for a long time, and no one stopped the feed. A new feeling settled over the diner, a new fear. Seconds later, a single headlight pierced through the darkness on the top of the screen. Paul's LeBaron zipped by a corner of the view and quickly arced around to a stop just off the screen. The display dimmed as his brake light shut off and all was still again. Paul groaned almost whimpered. You parked right by it, by where it went, Pink Sweater said. Paul remained quiet, but he could feel himself beginning to tremble. Y you see that? You parked right by it where it walked off screen. I mean, it couldn't have been a dozen yards away, just like right there. Hey, did you see that? He knows, Greasy Apron said. No one went back to the dining room. Greasy Apron discreetly slipped a butcher knife into the stained pouch of his apron. The waitress suddenly lost her sense of excitement. Paul put his back to the wall of the walk-in freezer and closed his eyes. Son of a bitch. The flickering sneer of the thing outside flashed across his vision and he snapped his eyes back open. How close had it been? Three metallic clicks drew everyone's attention to where the vet stood. His right pant cuff was now hitched above his boot, and a snub-nosed revolver glinted in his hand. More clicks sounded as he rotated the cylinder, eyeing the contents. 
Paul didn't feel any better, but he didn't feel any worse either. I'll go take a look, the vet said. He'd lost the spacey, burned-out look he'd worn moments before. He seemed almost totally in control of himself, except that his unarmed hand trembled. I don't know if that's such a good idea, Greasy Apron said. Just out to the dining room. We should lock the door, if nothing else, replied the vet. Door? Said the waitress. That door is single pane glass. If that thing from the video wanted in, it wouldn't even be slowed down by locking the damn door. Paul noted how she'd said thing from the video, as though it wasn't a real thing that existed just outside the flimsy walls of this isolated truck stop. He couldn't begrudge her a bitter denial. Well, it couldn't hurt, the vet said. He slipped a dented flask from inside his army greens and took a long draw. The acrid scent of whiskey drifted past the congealed fat and dish soap smell of the kitchen. The vet swallowed and sighed, but his hand didn't stop shaking. And now Paul saw that his gun hand was twitching as well. Maybe we should just wait here for the cops, Paul said. The vet looked down at his hands and back at Paul. He'd noticed him staring. Ah, uh, this ain't nothing. Just give the old magic some time to kick in. I'll be steady as a rock. He patted his coat, a semi-hollow thunk sounding from the flask inside. Paul shrugged. Seconds later, holding the revolver like a cop in Dragnet, the vet crept out to the dining room where they'd all just been sitting. A short silence ensued before his green-coated form crossed in front of the serving window. Hanging receipts fluttered as he passed. He rounded the counter and went up to the windows, crossing toward the door. Another short silence. Then a loud sound startled everyone. Paul thought it was a gunshot at first, but it wasn't that. Too metallic. It's all right, it's all right, it's... Greasy Apron whispered. Just the door latch, I've been... I've been meaning to get some graphite in it. Shh! The waitress hushed. Everyone fell silent again. The green coat crossed back in front of the window, but then stopped. He jolted around and everyone heard a gasp. They tensed. Holy shit! The vet said, half whispering. Get out here! Everyone, get out here! They didn't pause. Something in his voice overrode their fear of being seen by the thing outside the window. In a disordered herd, they bustled out into the dining room, looking around themselves like they'd never seen the place before. The vet was staring out the window, pointing his gun languidly towards the gas pumps, clearly not intending to fire. Paul squinted against the reflected light, then saw what had caught his attention. The corpse had moved. The video! The waitress said to herself as she trotted back to the camera display. No one else followed her, but waited and stared. Two of the videos had been ejected, but two others were still recording. A moment passed, and she said, My God, he's alive! Impossible, the trucker said. You said he was dead. The vet didn't look away. I just didn't want anyone to do anything stupid. You mean, you knew he was still alive? Pink Sweater gasped. I didn't know nothing, but I suspected something was off. And I was right, saw this back in the war. You injure a soldier just enough to make his compadres want to go out and rescue him, and then blam! Greasy Apron looked at the vet aghast and somewhat disgusted. The fuck you thinking? You ain't a nom anymore. He stopped when the corpse outside lifted a heavy arm and pulled himself a little closer to the light of the cafe. It was a slow and obviously painful move, desperate but hopeful. To hell with this, Greasy Apron said. He drew the butcher knife from his apron and began to round the counter. Stop right there, the vet said. He pointed a shaking finger at the cook and sidestepped to block his way. You ain't getting anyone else hurt for this stranger. He ain't one of ours, anyway. One of ours? Paul mouthed, confused. Get out of my way, Greasy Apron said, raising the knife. The vet reciprocated by pointing the stump-nosed revolver at his chest. Oh, you wouldn't. Don't test me, 
the vet said, quickly lowering the gun to point at the cook's knee instead. One of ours? Paul said out loud. What do you mean by that? What? The vet asked, not looking away from the big man with the knife. Paul persisted. Now just hold on, you two. What do you mean by one of ours? I just mean, he's not from this diner, okay? A stranger. Not worth dying over. Greasy Apron scoffed. Ain't none of us friends, fella. I don't even know your names. Oh, you need to leave the jungle, man. We ain't on no team here. Maybe we are, Paul said. Or you are. Think about it. It's trying to lure someone out of here for some reason. If it wanted to just get anyone, then it could have gotten me a long time ago when I was walking in. I mean, why else go through the trouble of the trap? Why not just snatch any old person off the road? Why not be happy with the victim he's already got? Man, I think you need a drink of what's in his pocket. Dougie chimed in. You're giving a lot of credit to a monster. Maybe, but if I'm right, then that means it doesn't want me or you two either. Paul pointed at the couple. Since you came in right before me, clearly it hadn't laid the trap for you. It could have snatched either of you up right off the bat. Think, guys, has anyone done anything to piss off whatever that thing is? Everyone looked at Paul like he was nuts. I know how this sounds. He began, but was interrupted by a low moan, a gurgling cry filtered through the glass. The injured man in the parking lot was trying to roll over. He moaned again. It sounded like help. Okay, fuck it, Paul continued. There's no time to figure this out. We've got to go out there. Like hell we do, said Dougie. Fine, then don't, but I'm rolling the dice here. I'm sure I'm right, Paul said. How sure? Asked Pink Sweater. Paul hesitated. And what if you're wrong? Paul thought for a second. Then I'll take that, he said, pointing to the gun. And I'll take that, Pink Sweater said, taking the knife gently from Greasy Apron's clenched fist. Honey. Hold on, what are you... Dougie stammered. Well, I can't do it alone. She said uncertainly. That guy's dead weight. But baby... Shove it, Doug. Now, let's hurry before I lose my nerve. Right, Paul said. Let's go. He took the gun from the vet and walked on weak legs to the front door. Pink Sweater waved off Dougie's protest and pushed her way to Paul's side. The lock clicked loudly open. Together, they counted from three and opened the door. Three, two, one. Paul didn't remember the night being so cold, or so still. He remembered the sound of the trees creaking, swaying in the breeze beyond the shore of light cast by the gas station. Even that was gone now. He tightened his hold on the sweaty gun grips and moved forward. The sound of footsteps behind him gave him a start. He glanced back at the woman with the knife. He'd already forgotten she was there. She nodded. The injured man, lying only a dozen or so feet away, gave out a groan when he saw them approach. Was it a warning? Paul steeled himself and forced his eyes to move up and scan the rim of light. Nothing moved at first. Okay, grab an arm and let's... He started to say, but stopped short. To his left... Just beyond the wavering rim of light, not three yards from the bumper of his beat-up old LeBaron, a shadow moved. What was that? The woman in the pink sweater quavered. She'd seen it too. For a moment, Paul had hoped it was his imagination. It moved again. A shadowed shape emerged and disappeared into the darkness. A low huffing sound echoed across the lot. No, not echoed. It came from the opposite direction. Paul warily moved his eyes to the sound. Another shadowed shape glinted through the trees. A huff drew his attention back to the original shape. It had moved again, but this time hadn't disappeared back into the shadows. It was huge. Hurry! Pink Sweater whispered, and Paul realized that he'd stopped moving. 
With tentative steps, he moved closer to the injured man until he was hovering over him. The man reached out a hand, supplicating, desperate. He groaned. Another huffing sound, almost a growl, rumbled through the air. The thing in the shadows shuffled around uneasily, then crouched until it was just another dark lump in the uneven night. Paul raised the gun. Another shadowed shape melted out of the darkness near it, then stood statue still except for its clenching and unclenching fists. How many of them were there? Hurry! Pink Sweater whispered again. Paul crouched slowly, dropping one hand from the pistol grip to take the injured man's arm. The shadow shifted again. The thing crouched lower onto all fours, like a racer at the starting line. It's coming! Paul shouted, panic cracking in his voice. Three loud reports shattered the stillness of the night as he frantically pulled the trigger. A murder of crows sleeping in the trees exploded into the night somewhere in the darkness beyond. A howl rent the air. Paul spun and fired twice more at where the other thing had been. A shot ricocheted distantly. He spun back to the first thing and saw it lurch into the light. It's still coming! He croaked and fired once more at the beast, now able to see its dark brown hair and grisly, ape-like face. It lurched again as a bullet slammed into its neck. A gout of black fluid belched out from the wound. Paul clicked off a few more spent chambers as the hollow snap of the hammer became lost amongst a din of howls that rose around the entire truck stop. So many! Paul's mind screamed. Hurry, damn it! Pink Sweater yelled. Raging voices echoed from the trees. Paul grabbed the injured man's arm and pulled. The woman in pink had dropped the knife and was pulling on his other arm with both hands. The man groaned in pain and terror. Together, they quickly dragged him to the glass door, which flung open to reveal the horrified face of the man in the greasy apron. His eyes were fixed on the shadows, his hand rapidly ushering them forward. They crossed the threshold and the door lock snapped shut loudly. Paul let go of the man's arm and half stumbled, half ran back to the kitchen. He let the gun clatter to the floor as he went, and when he saw the walk-in freezer, his wits abandoned him entirely. He flung open the door and stepped into the icy air, pulling it shut behind him. The howls clipped off with the closing of the door and were replaced by the hum of the cooling unit. Paul huddled in the corner, shivering, but not from the cold. Police. A muffled voice said through the insulated door. I'm coming in real slow. Don't worry, sir. We've got it under control. Please step back from the door. Paul uncoiled the bent wire from the emergency release handle of the door, where he'd twisted it to keep those things out. He took a shivering step backwards, holding a pork loin over his head, ready to brain any furry, ape-like thing that crossed the threshold. Maybe it was a trap. Maybe it was one of those things. They'd been pounding and banging to get in for the last half hour. They'd even begun mimicking the voices of the other diner patrons, trying to get him to unlock the door so they could come in and get him. Maybe this was another trick and... The door creaked open slowly. Two men in blue uniforms stood with their hands out. One held a badge. Paul sighed and dropped the frozen chunk of meat. He nearly crumpled to the floor in exhaustion, but one officer caught him. He was ushered out into the diner, now glowing with the floodlights of a dozen squad cars. The other people from the diner were all sitting in the vinyl seats giving him acid stares. He realized that he'd half convinced himself that they'd been killed by the things while he locked himself in the freezer. Truth and shame slowly dawned on him. Sorry, he eked. They didn't reply. A gurney surrounded by paramedics was near the door. Paul looked over to see the injured man being strapped to it. He had his head up and was talking to one of the medics as she shone a bright light into his eyes. Paul walked over. There he is, the medic said, pointing to Paul. The man who pulled you to safety. Oh, 
the injured man said meekly, looking through glazed eyes. Not him. Was the one who pulled me out. Just relax. You've had a concussion, the medic said dismissively. No, I need to see him, said the man. He looked over at Paul. Did you see him? Where is he? He saved my life. The injured man cringed with effort. His head dropped back on the pillow as the sedative took effect. A young officer sidled up to the cop standing behind Paul and said in hushed tones, Sir, we found the wreck about a mile up the road. It looks like a slide off, pretty well hidden in the underbrush. Probably wouldn't have even found it if he hadn't told us where it was. All right, rookie, get a wrecker out there. Lucky bastard would have died out there if someone hadn't come along. Someone? Paul echoed. Yeah, someone. Says a big man helped him out of the car, brought him here. Don't know nothing about that, would you? What? Thought so. What about those things? Paul asked. Whatever you shot, left a bloody patch over by that car, the cop replied. We've seen the tapes, don't really know what to tell you on that, but... A voice sounded from one of the vinyl booths. It was the man in the apron. They took the dead one after you valiantly hid yourself in our freezer. Then they left. We tried to tell you. He paused, then added sympathetically. I think they saved his life. Paul scowled. A wave of sudden realization flooded over him, followed by guilt. He pushed it away and sat down on a swivel stool at the counter. Shit, he sighed. I think I could use that coffee now.
Top Star.